Animal Farm by George Orwell Adapted from his own novel by George Orwell with Tamsin Gregg as the narrator, Nicky Henson as Napoleon and Toby Jones as Squealer. Ten o'clock had struck and Manor Farm was just settling down for the night or ought to have been settling down at any rate. Mr Jones, the farmer, had made his way up to bed, a little drunk, as usual. But all through the farm buildings, there was a stirring and a fluttering as the bedroom lights went out. The animals were creeping out of their stalls. Word had gone round during the day that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a wonderful dream last night and now wished to address the other animals on a matter of great importance. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of platform, Major was already sitting on his bed of straw under a lantern that hung from a beam. The hens perched themselves on the window sills, the pigeons fluttered up to the rafters, the cows and sheep lay down behind the pigs and began chewing the cud. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be any chickens or ducklings concealed in the straw. Molly, the pretty white mare who drew Mr Jones's trap on market days, took a place near the front and began flirting with her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was plaited with. Then came Muriel, the goat, and last of all came Benjamin, the donkey, with his long ears and his grizzled, obstinate-looking muzzle, the oldest animal on the farm and the worst-tempered. Comrades, quiet, quiet, everyone. He's starting. I do not believe, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months more. And before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it. Our lives are miserable, laborious and short. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. Why is it then that we continue in this miserable condition? Who is it that steals the produce of our labour from us? Tell me, comrades. What is the worst enemy we animals have to contend with? Please. <laughs> no, comrade, no. There are worse things than fleas, believe me. The whip. <laughs> that is nearer the mark. I will answer my own question, comrades. Man is our enemy. We are poor because the produce of our labour is stolen from us by human beings. There is the answer to all our problems. Remove man from the scene and the root cause of hunger and overwork has vanished forever. Man is the only animal that consumes without producing. You cows, how many gallons of milk have you given during the year? And what has happened to that milk, which should have been breeding up sturdy calves? Every drop of it has gone down the throat of our enemies. How many eggs ever hatched into chickens? And, and you, Clover, where are your foals? Each was sold at a year old, and you will never see one of them again. And even the miserable lives that we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. Think of the slaughterhouse, comrades. <laughs> Think of the butcher's shop. <laughs> to that horror we all must come. Cows, sheep, <laughs> pigs, hens, everyone. Even the horses and the dogs are no better off. You, Boxer, the very day that these great muscles of yours lose their power, 
Jones will sell you to the knacker, who will cut your throat and boil you down for the fox hunts. <laughs> I never thought of it like that. It's before. Jones who robs us of everything. Jones makes us work, and Jones keeps us hungry. Down with Jones! Down, Down with, with Jones. Jones! Down with Jones! Death to Jones! Comrades, it is not enough to say death to Jones. Death to humanity must be our motto. Death to mankind. <laughs> that is my message. I do not know when this rebellion will come. It might be in a week or not. Hundred years, but I know, as surely as I see this straw beneath my feet, that sooner or later justice will be done. <laughs> Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest, that the prosperity of one is the prosperity of the other. Man serves the interests of no creature except himself. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. And remember, too, that in fighting against man, you must not come to resemble him. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. All animals are equal. All animals are equal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune and the first three words. Last night, it came back to me in my dream. And what is more, the words also came back. Words I am certain which was sung by the animals of long ago and have been lost to memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrades. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beasts of England. <coughs> Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be your throne. And the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Albert. <clears throat> Albert. <clears throat> Wake up. What are them animals up to? <laughs> Can't you hear the noise they're making? Oh, it's fit to waken the dead. <clears throat> Let's come over him. Sounds like... Lummy, there's a fox in the yard. Where'd I put that gun? Here she is. Three nights later, old Major the Boar died peacefully in his sleep. His body was buried at the foot of the orchard. That was in early March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. The work of teaching and organising the others fell naturally upon the pigs, who were generally recognised as being the cleverest of the animals. Pre-eminent among the pigs were two young boars named Snowball and Napoleon, 
whom Mr. Jones was rearing up for sale. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers. The best known among them was a small, fat pig named Squealer, with very round cheeks, twinkling eyes, nimble movements and a shrill voice. These three had elaborated Major's teaching into a complete system of thought to which they gave the name Animalism. Several nights a week, after Mr Jones was asleep... Totally contrary to the spirit of animalism, comrades. Freedom is knowledge of necessity. Let me explain. What I want to know is, will there still be sugar after the rebellion? <sighs> Molly, you think of nothing except yourself. No, certainly not. When we're in control of this farm, we'll have to be self-supporting. We have no means of making sugar here. Quite right, Napoleon. Mm. Besides, don't you know sugar is bad for your teeth? <laughs> Shall I still be allowed to wear ribbons in my name, Snowball? Mm. Comrade Snowball, those ribbons you are so devoted to are the badge of slavery. Can you not understand that liberty is more important than ribbons? Yes, I suppose so. Horses do not need sugar. We can work better on oats and hay. As for the ribbons, I, I had not thought of it like that before, but Comrade Snowball is right. I, Boxer, shall never wear ribbons again. The only animal on the farm who refused to become excited about the rebellion was Benjamin, the donkey. In winter, there is the cold. In summer, there are the flies. There is never quite enough to eat, and there is always work. I was working before any of you were born and I shall be working after you are all dead. Donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. But you do believe, comrade, that the rebellion is going to happen? Everything happens sooner or later. On the other hand, nothing ever changes, except names, boxer. But work is not an evil. I think that when Jones is gone, there will be more food, but there will not be less work. I have worked hard for Jones and I will work twice as hard for the rebellion. <laughs> my brain is not good, but my muscles are good. Count on me. And me. And me. And me. And me. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. June came and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, which was a Saturday, Mr Jones went into Willingdon, the neighbouring market town, and got so drunk at the Red Lion that he did not come back till midday on Sunday. His men had milked the cows in the early morning and then gone out rabbiting. When Mr Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep on the drawing-room sofa with the news of the world over his face, so that when evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last, they could stand it no longer. Why should we put up with this? <laughs> said the cock. We work for him and he starves us. <laughs> if he won't feed us, we'll feed ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go down to the meadow and eat the hay. <laughs> a cow suggested, but a pigeon declared... No! I know where there's better food than that. The store shed. <laughs> Come on! To the store shed, everybody! <laughs> Here we are. Open the door. It's locked! Break it in, somebody. One of you cows, get your horn into that crack. There's that. That's right. Go! But just as the starving animals were in the act of helping themselves, Jones and his four men appeared in the yard. Stand firm, comrades! We'll beat them whips or no whips! Out of it, quick, you devils! Stand 
looking at him! Give him the whip! You can't do nothing with him, sir. Seems like they're... Here! Better keep off, you devil, you... The animals chased Jones and his men out onto the road and slammed the five-barred gate behind them. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had been successfully carried through. Jones was expelled and the manor farm was theirs. We've won! And now, comrades, back to the farm we go and wipe out every sign that human beings have ever lived there. The, the harvest room! The harvest room! Bring out the instruments of torture. Here are the birds. The nose rings! The castrating knives! The dog chains! Fling the whole lot of them down the well! Rings! Blinkers! Collars! Halters! Away they go! Here are the worst of all. The whips! <laughs> Onto the fire with them! The whips are burning! Look at the whips burning! The whips are burning! Those degrading ribbons that Jones used to decorate the horses' manes with, burn them! With the rest. Oh, must we burn the ribbons, all of them? Ribbons, Molly, are clothes. <laughs> all animals should go naked. <laughs> My hat shall go on the fire, too. So there. Yeah. What should we do with the farmhouse, Snowball? The farmhouse must be torn. Um, the farmhouse is a very desirable residence, comrades. Now, if we were to put it to but proper no use... no animal must ever live in it. I feel sure of that. No, no. We, we must, must never live in it. What did Major say? Never to live in a house. Uh, I have it. The farmhouse shall be preserved as a museum. <laughs> it will be a reminder to us of the folly and luxury in which human beings lived. Agreed. Agreed. The farmhouse Agreed. shall be a museum. And the farm must have a new name. The manor farm is too human. The new name must show it for what it is. The only farm in the whole country, in the whole of England, owned and operated by animals. It should be the farm of the animals. Mm. Beast farm. Mm. Animal manor. Huh. Animal farm. So be it, Napoleon. Animal farm. Of the golden future time Soon or late the day is coming Tyrant man shall be your throne And the fruitful fields of England Shall be trod by beasts alone Comrades! It is half past six and we have a long day ahead of us. Today we begin the hay harvest, but there is another matter that must be attended to first. I must tell you that during the past three months, we pigs have taught ourselves the art of reading and writing. We have also, by very careful study, succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. We propose now to inscribe these seven commandments on the wall of the big barn. Once written, they will form the unalterable law by which every animal on this farm must live. Oh, agreed. 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 agreed! Bring a pot of white paint and a ladder. Comrade Snowball shall write the commandments. He is the best at writing. 
Soon the commandments were written on the tarred wall in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. Now I'll read them out. One, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. <laughs> two, whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. Agreed, agreed. Three, no animal shall wear clothes. No. Four, no animal shall sleep in a bed. <laughs> Five, no animal shall drink alcohol. Six, no animal shall kill any other animal. Seven, all animals are equal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, to the hayfield. Let us make it a point of honour to get in the harvest in shorter time than Jones and his men could do. But the cows had not been milked for 24 hours, and their udders were almost bursting. After a little thought, the pigs sent for buckets and milked the cows fairly successfully, their trotters being well adapted to this task. Soon, there were three buckets of frothing, creamy milk, at which many of the animals looked with considerable interest. What is going to happen to all that milk? Jones used sometimes to mix some of it in the hen's mash. No, never mind the milk, comrades. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball shall lead the way. I will follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrades! The hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield to begin the harvest. And when they came back in the evening, it was noted that the milk had disappeared. All that day, and every day for a week to come, how they toiled and how they sweated to get the hay in. The work with implements which had been designed for human beings, was not easy or simple. But the pigs were so clever that they could find a way round any difficulty. And as for the horses, they knew every inch of the field. In the end, their efforts were rewarded. It was the biggest harvest the farm had ever had, and not an animal stole as much as a mouthful. All through that summer, the farm ran like clockwork. The pigs, with their cleverness, and Boxer, with his tremendous cart horse muscles, were equal to anything. Boxer had been a hard worker even in Jones's time, but now he seemed more like three horses than one. His answer to every difficulty, every setback, was... I will work harder. On Sundays, there was no work. After breakfast, the green flag, which had been chosen as the emblem of the farm, it was really an old tablecloth of Mrs Jones's, which Snowball had found in the harness room, was run up the flagstaff. And then the animals trooped into the big barn for a general assembly known as the Meeting, which ended with the singing of Beasts of England. And the afternoon was given up to study and recreation. Snowball busied himself with organising what he called animal committees. He formed the Egg Production Committee for the hens, the Clean Tails League for the cows, the Wild Comrades Re-Education Committee to tame the rats and rabbits, and the Whiter Wool Movement for the sheep. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The cat joined the re-education committee and was very active in it for some days. She was seen sitting on a roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all animals were now comrades and that any sparrow who chose could come and perch on her paw. But the sparrows kept their distance. Snowball also instituted classes in reading and writing, and these were a great success. By the autumn, almost every animal on the farm was literate in some degree. Comrade Snowball, I know the whole alphabet now, but I cannot read words. Um, 
Muriel can read words. Yeah, okay. Benjamin can read quite well, but he says there's nothing worth reading. Um, Box has only been able to learn A, B, C, D. And the sheep and the ducks and the hens cannot get beyond a B. Also, uh, Conrad, they say they've not been able to learn the commandments by heart. Uh, don't you think you could shorten the commandments in some way so that everyone can learn them? Hmm. Let me see. I think it can be done. Ah, yes, Clover, I have it. Now listen. Four legs good, two legs bad. There you have the essential principle of animalism in six words. Oh, my gosh. We have two legs. Uh, comrades, comrades. A bird's wing is an organ of propulsion and not of manipulation. It should therefore be regarded as a leg. The distinguishing mark of man is the hand with which he does all his mischief. Uh, four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good... Two legs bad. Excellent, comrades. Uh, Keep the maxim in mind and you will be completely safe against human influences. Uh, four, four legs good, good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. It happened that Jessie and Bluebell had whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth between them to nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they were weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mothers, saying that he himself would be responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft, which could only be reached by a ladder, and there kept them in such seclusion that the farm soon forgot their existence. That's a funny setup over at Jones, isn't it? Can't last, of course. All them brutes will be starving long before winter comes on bound to. What I mean to say, it's against nature, ain't it? But, uh, look here. When them animals chased Jones out, we all said they'd be starving inside of a fortnight, didn't we? Well, they ain't starved. Yet. No, but it ain't winter. Yet. Yeah, but look here. Supposing we was the... Oh, here, give us a stone. <laughs> Get off, you devil! You... It's all over the place, that tune is. If you ask me, it's time it was put a stop to. It wouldn't take much to do it. Just half a dozen of us go up there with the cart whips and maybe a gun or two, and, and then we yeah, creep. But what I did think, and this is between you and I, mind you, hmm? I did think that it mightn't be a bad idea to leave them animals in possession for a bit. Suppose Jones finds us he can't get them out, what'll he do? Sell the farm and sell cheap. We can't do nothing else. And it's a nice little property to man a farm is. Yeah, there was a lot of us thought that. But then it wasn't to be expected, as them animals would make a job of it. But from what I hear, uh, don't uh, pass this on, of course. From what I hear, they ain't doing so bad. They got their A in like Christians. No, no, that won't do, see. It sets a bad example. Suppose our animals get to trying it on. What I say is, we all got to hang together. After all, we all live off animals, don't we? Yeah. Got to keep a firm hand on them, of course. And to keep them under, we've got to keep them ignorant. Once let them find out as they can do without us, then where'd we be? The sooner Jones gets his farm back, the better for us all. Well, maybe you're right. That's settled, then. I'll have a word with one or two of the others and fix a day. We won't half teach those beggars a lesson. Just let me get in among them with a whip and there'll be bloody murder. OK, I'll give you a hand. Are you coming to church this morning? All right. Up there, bell's been ringing these ten minutes. Come on, we'd best step lively. But the animals were aware of these developments. They had their spies and sympathisers everywhere, and they were not surprised when one day, early in October, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones is coming! The men are coming back! A whole lot of them! Six of them all carrying big sticks! They've just come through the They're coming up the cart track now. Jones is at the head of them and he's got his gun! Every animal to his post! Comrade Snowball takes command. 
and Snowball launched his first attack. But the men, with their hobnail boots, were too strong for them. At the signal for retreat, the animals fled into the yard, and the human beings, seeing, as they thought, their enemies in flight, rushed after them in disorder. Come on, boys. Now we got them. Drive them up into that there corner, and then we'll give them what for. Here, look out, there's a whole load more of them coming. Oh. Oh. <laughs> At this moment, Snowball sprang his surprise. As soon as the men were well inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows and the rest of the pigs suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. And so, within five minutes of their invasion, the human beings were in ignominious retreat by the same way as they had come, with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. The pellets only grazed me. This battle must have a name, comrades. I suggest the Battle of the Cowshed. Yes. Agreed. 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 The Battle of the Cowshed. The Battle of the Cowshed. The Battle of the Cowshed. After the Battle of the Cowshed, Jones gave up hope of getting his property back and went to live in another part of the county. The animals were now secure in their possession of the farm. The neighbouring human beings did not hate them any less than before, but they had developed a sort of grudging respect for them, one symptom of which was that they now took to calling Animal Farm by its proper name and stopped calling it the Manor Farm. As winter drew on, Molly started to be late for work and to find excuses to go to the pond and gaze at her own reflection. One day Clover took her aside. Molly, I have something very serious to say to you. This morning I saw you looking over the hedge at the neighbouring farm and allowing a man to stroke your nose. What does that mean? He didn't. I wasn't. It isn't true. <laughs> a thought struck Clover. She went to Molly's stall and turned over the straw with her hoof. There was a little pile of lump sugar and some coloured ribbons. Three days later, Molly disappeared. There were rumours that she had been seen between the shafts of a smart dog cart with her mane clipped and a ribbon round her forelock looking very happy. None of the animals ever mentioned Molly again. In January, the frost and snow made it impossible to do much work in the fields, so there were many meetings in the big barn, and the work of the coming year was carefully planned out. It had come to be accepted that all questions of farm policy should be decided by the pigs. The vote was still taken, but the main decisions had always been made beforehand. The other animals thought this arrangement quite a reasonable one, but just occasionally... Boxer, do you remember how the cows were milked on the day of the rebellion? Yes, and I remember that when we came back in the evening, the milk had disappeared. It has disappeared every day since. Do you know what happens to it? I have just found out. It is mixed every day into the pig's mash. No other animal gets a drop of it. I do not think that's any concern of ours. What use is milk to a horse? Yes, but there are also the apples. When the orchard was picked, the apples were stored in the harness room. And now I hear that every one of them is to be kept for the pigs. 
what was that you were talking about, comrades? Ah, the milk and the apples. <laughs> Let me put that in its right perspective for you, comrades. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades. Milk and apples contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty even for a single day? Jones would come back. Jones left this district after the Battle of the Cowshed. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. <sighs> Comrade Squealer's explanation seems to be quite satisfactory, Clover. Yes, Squealer is very good at explaining things. So the pigs continued to be the real controllers of the farm, and Napoleon and Snowball were their acknowledged leaders. But unfortunately, as winter wore on, the rivalry between these two became more acute. Indeed, at every meeting that was held... Silence! I will be heard! Comrade Napoleon, if you had even the most elementary knowledge of scientific farming... I am not interested in scientific farming. I am a practical pig. At least I know how to grow cabbages. Listen, I have looked this up in the farmer and stock breeder. I have the passage by heart. I will repeat it to Four you. Legs good, On light two legs soils. Bad. Four legs good, two legs mad. Four legs have you good, noticed, two Benjamin, legs bad. that the Four sheep legs always good, break into that slogan when Four Snowball is speaking, good, never when Napoleon is speaking? Good, Quite a coincidence, good, is it not? But of all the struggles between Snowball and Napoleon, None was so bitter as the struggle over the windmill. Think of it, comrades. Think what we could do if we had electricity on this farm. A chaff cutter, a mangle slicer, a milking machine, electric light in every animal stall. That's wonderful. Ah, oh, but it's so good to be true. It's impossible. Electricity can do anything. Let me tell you. But if we had a dynamo and a windmill on the knoll, no animals on this farm need do more than two hours' work a day. Pay no attention to him. This is not a time to be filling our heads with dreams. We have a hard year's work ahead of us. Before all else, our output of food must be increased. When we have built the windmill, food production will increase 1,000%. And I say that if we waste time on this windmill of yours, we should all starve to death long before it is built. I wonder, I wonder. Only 12 hours' work. It might be true. I've seen the plans of the windmill. Snowball has drawn them out in chalk on the floor of one of the sheds. He says it's all worked out down to the last detail. I wonder. Vote for Snowball and a 12-hour week. Vote for Napoleon and the full dinner pail. Vote for Napoleon. Vote for Snowball. Think of your stalls with hot and cold water and electric light. Every one of you could lie in bed till 10 o'clock in the morning. It's wonderful. Lie in bed till 10 o'clock. Vote for Snowball. Vote, Vote for, for Snowball. Rise. Don't listen to these fairy tales he's telling you. Snowball, I warn you to be silent. I will not be silent. Comrades, Four legs good. listen to me. Two legs bad. Four legs good. I will Two not be bad. shouted down. Comrades. Every animal who has the welfare of this farm at heart will vote for the windmill. Let us cast off the burden of the past, I tell you. Snowball, for the last time I warn you to sit down. I will not sit down. I... Then on your own head, be it. <whistles> Nine enormous dogs wearing brass studded collars dashed straight for Snowball. In a moment, he was out of the door and they were after him. He was running as only a pig can run, but the dogs were on his heels. One of them all but closed his jaws on Snowball's tail, but Snowball whisked it free just in time. 
Then he put on an extra spurt and slipped through a hole in the hedge and was seen no more. Silent and terrified, the animals crept back into the barn. These were the nine puppies whom Napoleon had taken from their mothers. They were huge, savage-looking dogs, and they kept close to Napoleon. Let every animal sit down and listen to me. Now that the traitor has been expelled from our midst, a new chapter in the history of the farm can begin. From today onwards, the Sunday meetings will be discontinued. They are unnecessary and a waste of time. What? No more meetings? Uh, 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 comrades. No, no, comrades. You will still assemble here on Sunday mornings to receive the orders for the week. But there will be no more debates. All questions relating to the working of the farm will be settled by a special committee of pigs, presided over by myself. And a very good arrangement, too. Think of all the brain work that will save you, comrades, not having to think for yourselves any longer. No more no, no, meetings. That's, that's, that's not what no, Major no, said. Even Boxer was vaguely troubled. He set back his ears and tried hard to marshal his thoughts, but in the end he could think of nothing to say. Some of the pigs themselves, however, were more articulate. Four young porkers sitting in the front row sprang to their feet. Comrade Napoleon, I protest. You protest? Uh, yes. Uh, well, that, that is to say... That... <laughs> well? Comrade, this is undemocratic. Uh, uh, at, uh, at least it's precisely undemocratic, but... um. Obviously, Comrade, what, what you have done is strictly democratic, but I... Well, are you still protesting? No, Comrade, I have stopped protesting. Then the meeting is at an end. Oh, and one last word. Remember always that when there has been one rebellion, there can never be another. That is the just rule of rebellion. Oh, ah, no, 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 no. Comrades, comrades, before we part... I wish to propose a vote of thanks to Comrade Napoleon for his self-sacrifice in taking this extra labour upon himself. Remember, comrades, that it is for our sakes that he has chosen to bear this burden. Three cheers for our leader, Comrade Napoleon! Hooray! Hooray! So the Sunday meetings came to an end, and Napoleon reigned as the undisputed master of Animal Farm. I have a glorious piece of news for you. The windmill. You, you all remember our great leader Napoleon's project, which Snowball attempted to obstruct. The windmill is to be built after all. Work will begin tomorrow. I thought it was Snowball who wanted the windmill. No, 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 no. You, you have remembered it wrong, Clover. It was Comrade Napoleon's idea from the very start. But Snowball had the plans all drawn out on the floor of the sheds. Stolen. Stolen from among Comrade Napoleon's private papers. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, comrades, that Snowball was a mutineer. In fact, he was hardly better than a traitor, Muriel. He fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed, Squealer. Aye. Bravery is not enough, Comrade Boxer. Loyalty and obedience are more important. And as for the Battle of the Cowshed, I believe the time will come when we shall find that Snowball's part in it was very much exaggerated. But from today onwards, comrades, we must have only one thought the building of the windmill. It will be a hard task, I warn you. It may even be necessary to reduce our rations at some time during the year. No matter. Once the windmill is built, there will be plenty of everything for everybody. 
I will work harder. We'll all work harder. Long live the windmill. Long live Comrade Napoleon. Long, Long live, live Comrade, Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon. Long, Long live, live Comrade, Comrade Napoleon. 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 And how they worked right through that year. The hardest task was the breaking of the stone. Since the animals were unable to use picks and crowbars, the only way of doing it was to utilise the force of gravity. They lashed ropes round huge boulders on the floor of the quarry and then, all together, cows, horses, sheep, any animal that could lay hold of the rope, even the pigs sometimes joined in at critical moments. With desperate slowness, they dragged them to the top of the quarry where they were toppled over the edge to shatter to pieces below. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer. His strength seemed equal to that of all the other animals put together. It was a noble sight to see him toiling up the slope, inch by inch, his breath coming fast, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground and his great sides matted with sweat. In addition to his first motto of I will work harder, Boxer had now adopted a second. Napoleon is always right. He had also made arrangements with one of the cockerels to wake him in the morning half an hour earlier than the other animals, so that he could go down to the quarry and carry away an extra load of stone, unassisted. All through the summer the animals did not fare badly. And yet, from time to time, things still happened, which didn't actually cause murmurings, for somehow nobody felt inclined to murmur nowadays. There were too many dogs prowling about. Boxer, Muriel, yeah? have you heard what has happened? The pigs have moved into the farmhouse and are living there. Living what? in the farmhouse? Aye. Did we not pass a resolution never to live in the farmhouse? Yes. It was on the day of the rebellion. Was that resolution written down, Clover? No, it was not written down. But there is something else. Do you know that the pigs are not only living in the farmhouse, they have also taken to sleeping in the beds. <laughs> Benjamin, I want you to read one of the commandments for me. You know, I never meddle in such matters. Oh, Muriel, you can read. Come with me to the end wall of the barn. There now. Read me the fourth commandment. Does it not say something about never sleeping in a bed? It says, No animal shall sleep in a bed ah. with sheets. With sheets? Oh, I'd forgotten about the sheets. We must have learned it wrong. With sheets? How strange. Yeah. Oh, sure. shh, 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 shh. What was that you were saying, comrades? Ah, you have heard that we pigs are sleeping in the beds at the farmhouse. And why not? You didn't suppose, comrades, that there was ever a ruling against beds. A bed merely means a place to sleep in. A pile of straw in a stall is a bed, properly regarded. We have removed the sheets from the farmhouse beds and sleep between blankets. Mm. You wouldn't rob us of our repose, would you, comrades? You wouldn't have us too tired to carry out our duties. Surely none of you wishes to see Jones come back. No, 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 no